was left as he left, it, but now that it underwent a thorough restoration, they found out that there were a whole bunch of plates and goblets and this and that, which he painted and then painted over. Yeah. He was so hesitant. Hmm. There is some, one of the apostles even had an extra hand because, because he, left, he abandoned the figure and then returned to it. And it and what, so which is what you were saying is that to be a successful mural painter, you have to be decisive. You can't, be, decisive. You, you can't keep changing yeah. your mind and coming back and, no. well, I don't like that. No. And no. You have to know what you're doing and be decisive about it. No, he, he loved to abandon things. And none of the things which he created really worked. It's, it's, he was such a genius that he foretold to us that there will be a submarine. He foretold to us all kinds of cannons, very modern cannons, the, the flying machine, everything. But he himself could not do it. He just gave an idea. And so he was a he was a, a visionary, a, but he, yes, he wasn't he wasn't very good at yeah. actually executing it. No, no. Okay. And of course, later scientists returned to his work and studied it and studied it, and they lived out, out of him for centuries. They they were able to execute what he just dreamt about. Okay. Now, you, in, you've showed some other, in some of your papers, and I don't know if it's this one or which one it is, but, but every artist uses a model yes. to paint on. If you're, and, and so it's this, it's this, it goes back to this foreshortening thing that we talked about before the break. And, and the, the perspective that an artist would have to have in order to paint the man that we see pictured on the shroud, and in order to in order to paint that perspective that we see, in the artist you would have to be standing about how many feet above? About fifteen to seventeen feet. So in order to get that 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 perspective of the man lying on the shroud, you'd have to you'd have to be up on a ladder about fifteen to seventeen feet above to get the perspective that we see. On the shroud, with you know, with the shoulders drawn up and the legs drawn up, yes. and 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 the fact that there doesn't appear to be any light focus um, in, in it at all, and and, and so there, uh, you know, so the question is then then how does one paint from 15 feet away? A, or, a canvas which is 14 feet wide, <laughs> it's impossible. You know, People just don't picture the actual movements of the artist. He cannot, he only can make a small, very small painting, very small. And if you try to magnify it, as sometimes you do a small sketch and then you, you magnify it to actual size, it loses the detail. You don't see anymore what you see on the shroud. So it's impossible. You, you cannot stretch your arms. So, and so you, that's far. right. I remember you read, telling about this, that, that as you go closer to the image, it, like, like a, a, a typical painting, you lose detail. But yes. with the shroud, you gain detail in terms yes. of getting down into into the into the into the pixels and seeing how it how it's how it how it's how it's created in the blood stains and and so it really doesn't act like a painting. I mean, and that I have to correct. Okay. So, so many of my shroud colleagues get used to it. Maybe a scientist started to say that that because you have to back off and see the shroud from 15, 20 feet in order to really see it, that it's not like a painting. This is not a good argument because every painting you paint like that. The artist is like a runner. <laughs> there is the canvas, what you see from close, it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. You have to run back and forth, back oh, right, and forth, right, back right. and forth. I, I see what you're saying. So, yes. so the fact that it doesn't look like much close up does, yeah, you know, that, it, that, that is not that's not really art. an argument that you would yeah, use no, from the standpoint no, of art no. because because any large artwork up close isn't going to look yeah, like anything. Exactly. You have to stand back to really yes, appreciate yes, the overall yes, artistic yes. piece. So, but I precisely see what you're for the same reason, how can somebody standing 15 feet 
or 20 feet up in the air. You, you cannot even step out with your foot. I noticed that I had to put one foot over the other because my own foot would cover the model underneath. To get that identical yes. perspective per that we perspective, see on the yes. shroud. Yes. And then what makes things even doubly harder is the dorsal image because yes. the because here the even there we see that the dorsal image is 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 somewhat longer uh, than the frontal image because yes. now you have because but the because the body's drawn up and so as you were saying in order to capture from an artistic standpoint to capture the dorsal side now this alleged model this whoever this person was who who volunteered for this you know then had to be kind of you know turn himself over in the exact same position he was when he was lying down on his back and, and now he's he, and now his 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 weight is going to be where on his his it's like his nose no or, no man could do that i mean you, mean, no I mean, you wouldn't it's because, not like you just kind of yes, lay down yes, flat yes, because what we yes. see is the is the the dorsal image has has the same foreshortening characteristics as the frontal yes, image, yes. and and so it would be you know it would be you know virtually impossible. Uh, for completely that Completely impossible because he would have to balance himself on the tip of his nose, on the top of one hand only, and one knee. That's all. Now, you now there are those that would say you know there are all kinds of again we get into these into these theories that well maybe it was a Maybe it was a hot statue and some kind of a dust rubbing. What, what would you say about that? Oh, who, who in the Middle Ages could make a statue that realistic? There is no way. Plus, no matter how good the statue is, you still see that it's a statue. It's not a living person. And to heat a huge piece of bronze or whatever material, they, no way. You can't heat it like that. It would have to be so even that only the most modern, maybe electric system or something could Right, do. because what we see here is, is that the, the, the intensity of the image is identical from top yes. to bottom, yes. front to back. Yes. There's no difference in the intensity of the image, which, which suggests what, what you just said, is that you'd almost need some kind of a piece of technology in order to have oh, a consistent... Yes heat if in fact no infrared thermography would tell you that it, this image is not the result of heat because the image does yeah, not yeah. does not fluoresce the way that the burns that from yes. the fire in 1532 yes. those burns fluoresce but the image does not so you know, so if heat was involved in the formation of the image there wasn't there, there wasn't a lot of heat and 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 so but that heat had to be applied perfectly consistently over the, the, the entire bronze sculpture and of course yeah. now the problem is so that's a problem but then the second problem is finding an artist who predated well, Leonardo by a hundred years who had the ability <laughs> to create such a lifelike and in, in, in beginning, we don't we don't get into lifelike images like that until the Renaissance and um, yes, you know, so. so so here again we now we come up with that event horizon thing this yes. this 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 kind of cultural historical barrier that you that yes. that you cannot assume that someone in the 1300s uh, knew of te or knew of knew of, of a technology that would occur you know 200 300 500 years later you just can't do it yes. and it's um, so so whatever theory we come up with has to fit within the cultural context of exactly. that artist yes plus there is another third thing that if you make a statue even a hit that statue and you put a canvas on it and 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 it kind of go into all the cavities and the the, uh, the raised parts and everything, and then you pull off the canvas. It's a wide, wide, uh, stretched image, very ugly and, and completely out of anatomy. Right, and so, so there's a horizontal so if you were expansion. To, so, so, so one of the, you know, if, if you were to take a cloth and just wrap it around a face and then stretch it like yeah. this, it would be all real rounded. Yeah. It would yeah, be, it would, it would be out, of, out of proportion. Yeah, huge horizontal expansion. So, which, which gets us, which is kind of an interesting clue then 
as you know, so now we're back to Isabel saying, okay, this is not the work of an artist, so what is it? And so, you know, so naturally we're back to, is it possible that this is the burial shroud that wrapped the historical Jesus of Nazareth when he was in the tomb? I mean, that's the debate. If this was the shroud of Julius Caesar, we wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right, right, right now. And so yeah. it's, um, so the, uh, the, this, this, the, the, the fact that, that the shroud appears to have three-dimensionality to it or distance information, okay, yet at the same time, we know that, that, that just taking a cloth and wrapping it around a face would create a distortion, so, yes. which then tells you that the – now this you – know, on other places, on, on, on some of the writings that I've done, you'll, you'll, you'll know that I call the shroud the X-Files of Christianity. Which is, you know, it, you know, because there, there is some really strange things about this image, That's right. and and one of this is that 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 the that the image formation mechanism appears to be a vertical phenomenon perpendicular to the cloth, so it so it doesn't it would, it would is that right? Yes, no. The most modern, oh, excuse me, the most modern investigation I'm conducting does as an even more complicated image. It's not even just up and down because the parts which uh, are concave and turn away from the perpendicular still register. And the mm. system of that is maddeningly complicated. So like the, the side of the nose is, or something. The shroud is so much more complicated than the any one of us, and even put together, realize. It, and it's, I, in my opinion, as a scientist, not just an, as an artist, as a scientist, I must say that no human being has that much brain to, yeah. to bring it forth. It's, it's, a, it's a divinely made item, and he really put us to the test to such a test that I admire what nerve God had <laughs> to expect us miserable little beings to, to understand what he did. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, I, you know, the, what you'll see as a consistent theme in Shroud University is that the Shroud is a fabulous mystery and it could very well be the most important archaeological artifact on the planet. Uh, and in the significance of the shroud is related to its potential. Because if the shroud is, in fact, the burial shroud of Jesus, and that image that's on there is the result of the resurrection, and the bloodstains is the result of crucifixion, I think you'd have to agree with me that that is that is enormous. And so the potential of the shroud is, is incredible, which is why people like myself and Isabel and other researchers continue to investigate it because it's too important to just flippantly say, oh, well, it's medieval fake. We know that. It was carbon dated to the Middle Ages. Well, you know, not so fast. And it's you, know, you. Some of you might remember the news commentator Paul Harvey, and I always like to say, "Well, today I'm Paul Harvey, and you're going to hear the rest of the story." And that's what we're trying to tell on Shaw University: is that there's a lot to this story be beyond just the simple uh, soundbite from the evening news or, or an occasional documentary that you see that just hits the high points. There's a lot of there's a lot here, and so if you're a student and you're watching this. I encourage you to investigate the shroud. Find a way to incorporate the, 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 the shroud into a, a, maybe you have to do a paper, a project, a presentation, a speech, something related to history, art, chemistry. Find a way to incorporate the shroud into it. I think it'll give you a reason to investigate it and uh, you'll find it fascinating. And um, so, Isabel, it has been wonderful to visit with you here in your studio. And um, is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience before we leave? Yes, very much so. I think that Ras Braut did a magnificent job 
explaining this shroud to people. He's unique in this, that it speaks to the young especially, and we need young people to come to this research. God bless him for doing it and doing such a great job. Thank you, Isabel. I appreciate that. So, okay. Well, listen, stay tuned for the next uh, video blog. And this is also the audio of this is going to be on the uh, on uh, Shoutcast, which is, uh, which is a podcast that, that we do. And you can find that on iTunes. Just look for Shoutcast. And you can download it and listen to this. So, until next time, Russ Brialt from Shout University. I want to welcome you to our show. Uh, we have a world-renowned artist, Isabel Pitsek. And uh, Isabel lives in California now, but she's originally from Hungary, and in fact escaped from Hungary at the age of 14. And um, now, now, we talked about this, Isabel, before. And, and at, the, at the age of 14, you submitted a sketch, if you will, a proposal for a mural to be painted in the Vatican. And out of dozens of submissions by professional artists, your, your art was, was selected. And explain that to me. What, how That seems so remarkable. Well, I have submitted a painting to an international exhibition in Rome. And I have won the International Grand Award for mural, for painting. And so the priests noticed me, so to speak, and uh, they suggested that I should uh, submit a sketch together with so many other people. And they didn't, we had to include into an envelope our plans with just a number. Mm -hmm. And the number was registered with a name with the office. And so they didn't know that I'm just a very young girl. And the famous art historian, Father Kirschbaum, and several other art critics chose my work. It was selected. And so first, when they learned that I'm just a little girl, they were very nervous <laughs> about this project. And then uh, I had to prove my abilities by executing one third of the mural cartoon, the original mm -hmm. size drawing. And uh, that was judged again by these famous people. And again, I was selected, so I got the pen, the mural. And with your kind permission, I will show it to your audience okay. right now. Isabel, what are we looking at here? This is the mural in the Pontifical Biblical Institute in the Vatican. It's 400 square feet representing the second miraculous fishing with twice life-size figures. Another mural I like to show to you here you see me on the mm -hmm. scaffold visiting with a shaky reporter who didn't like to climb that high this mural is 70 feet high we are about 70 50 feet 70 yes. feet high now feet. now this is this is fairly recent what we're looking yes, at here it's fairly recent it's at the guardian angel cathedral in Las Vegas and so far that is my most famous work and the one we saw first was the one you did when you were 14 years yes, old? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, Yes, okay. that's right. And this is the finished mural. As you see, it goes way up into 70 feet. The figure of Christ in the center, the risen Christ, is seven times life size. Seven times life yes, size. Fifth, that's enormous. It's fifth, 70 feet high? Yes, sev the, the mural is 70 feet high. This is supposed to be the fifth largest figure ever painted in modern art history. And uh, this is a gigantic stained glass on which I am working now. Uh, I am working on the two sides of this huge stained glass uh, and So this is, this is a work in progress right now? In progress right okay. now. This is 560 square feet, and the two sides are about 1,000 square feet. Oh, that's together. enormous. Yes. Isabel, 
you certainly are an accomplished artist, even at the age of 14. And one of the reasons that you're here on the Shroud Report is, is because you are a devotee of the Shroud. And, and, and as an artist, uh, you're convinced that the Shroud of Turin is not the work of an artist. And, and I, I think I would like and our audience would, would like to hear from the perspective of a professional artist like yourself why you are so convinced that the Shroud simply cannot be the work of an yes. artist. I am most grateful for this question because I always feel that it is the professional artist who should answer the question whether or not the Shroud is a, a painting. Mm -hmm. After all, we make the paintings and we cannot forget that art and a, a painting on a wall or on a canvas is an optical illusion. People mm -hmm. don't think of that. An optical illusion which is created by the marriage, so to speak, of the art mediums and the, the pigments. Mm -hmm. Something is not a painting if just one of these items exists on a painting. They create the illusion in your art that you are uh, in your eyes that you are looking at the painting. Mm -hmm. So some of our own experts even, almost everyone commits one mistake. You don't start with analyzing paint pigments. It's just dust, it's nothing. You analyze the mediums. And in the Middle Ages, the mediums were emulsions water soluble colloidal emulsions that's the professional name for them egg tempera or gum tempera or glue tempera these are the emulsions so the e emulsions is the is the solution the kind of liquid yes. that yes. the various pigments were dissolved in and yes. mixed up in yes and then later on painted onto whatever the surface that yes. they were and painting on yes exactly okay. you you see it so well and and the, these pigments are suspended mm -hmm. in, in the medium. They are not like the thermoplastic mediums, which are oil paints, and, and they are completely one with the medium. These are just suspended. And they leave a definite and noticeable paint film, mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. If you don't see that on something, that is not a painting. So in and other words, if you have an emulsion that has a pigment in it, then that emulsion is going to leave a film. It's going to leave something on there. Yes, exactly. Okay. And, and the, the most important argument is that this film created by the emulsion must be intact. The minute it's not intact, then, then you, parts of the painting are, are missing. So if the emulsion isn't intact, then, then, the, then the pigment's going to fall away. Exactly. And then you have yes. no painting. Yes. And, and, yes. and so... And, and so what, relating that back to the shroud, is that, is there any evidence of any kind of an emulsion on the shroud? Absolutely none. And since the, the shroud is a continuous, homogeneous image, that you don't see any interruptions on it, maybe at, at the wrist a little bit. So it, it and it, yet it do, doesn't have any kind of emulsion film on it. It makes sense that it's against the laws of nature for it to be a painting. It's that serious. It's against the laws of nature, and it's, it would be a miracle if a painting would exist without an intact emulsion. Okay, because the emulsion yes. is what causes the image to be visible. Yes, And without exactly. the emulsion, you, yes. there is no way for the pigment yes, to no attach to, itself to, to, yes, the, to yes. the surface. Yes, a everything, okay. even pastels, charcoals have a, have a certain, you have to use fixatives then. Mm -hmm. So this is perhaps the strongest argument. The second is that every painting shows a, a light focus. The light focus means simply that you know exactly where your light is coming from. Mm -hmm. what, from what side, from a 